Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another local author series. And today we have another um, fan favorite with us, to say the least. We have Miss Eileen Kilgore Henderson, and we're here to talk about her latest memoir, The World Through the Dime Store Door. Eileen, how are you doing today? All right, thank you. Thanks for joining us. So in your, um, in your latest memoir, The World Through the Dime Store Door, it paints a great picture of um, small town life in the early 1900s. Immediately, I was intrigued by the mention um, of your family, your family purchasing a Sears and Roebuck pre-made house. Now, many of my peers may not know what that is. Could you talk a bit about the, the Kilgore family home in Brookwood? All right. Uh well, uh, the, we children were not uh, very impressed with that fact that it was a Sears and Roebuck uh, pre-made house. We just thought it was beautiful. But uh, uh, we did find out later that uh, the, uh, it was already built when we moved in. And uh, it was... Uh, it's still standing here in Brookwood. It looks a little different because uh, succeeding owners have changed it somewhat. But we uh, did uh, think that it was a beautiful house. It had big windows, lots of sunlight, and an upstairs. That was amazing to us because we came from a coal mining town that uh, none of our houses had an upstairs and we loved that part of it. And uh, we just enjoyed the house uh, so very much because we thought it beautiful. But there was another Sears and Roebuck house in our Brookwood. It was across from the uh, new high school and it was called the Teacherage. And uh, it was a place for teachers to stay if they wanted to. And it was not as attractive as our house. It was sort of gray and had many bedrooms, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes I was invited to play in the yard of uh, one of my classmates that lived in the teacherage. And uh, we, uh, it was there that I was standing outside the uh, living room window where my mother was inside listening to the radio. That's where I heard President Roosevelt say those famous words, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. But I knew better. <laughs> <laughs> we had to fear an empty stomach and uh, a foreclosure on our house and all that. But anyway, it all worked out. Uh, that's actually a, a great um, transition into our next question because this memoir, it covers um, a pretty tense time in American history. Um, it, it, it starts off um, around the area um, following the Great Depression leading into World War II. But um, you opened the book up saying you were born in paradise. So just talk a bit about your, um, your family dynamic during this time and how your family navigated these um, turbulent times. Well, many people would not think that was paradise. This was a small uh, coal mining camp on the, what is now Highway 11 between Vance and Colin. There's no sign of it now. It used to be a family cemetery of a big farm, but it was sold for the coal and for the coal mining company. But we children, I had three sisters and we knew no better. We loved living there and we played and played and played. We had no chores to do and uh, lots of children to play with. And uh, we uh, had many 
uh, games we played up, uh, we made up, and uh, sometimes the boys, when we were playing, would get into a fight. We liked to gather around them and shout, fight, fight, ain't no kin, kill each other, ain't no sin. And we <laughs> thought that was, but the mothers soon came and straightened us out. So before we get into your time working at a dime store, once again, um, for those who may not know, could you explain what a dime store is? A dime store, you, a, a dime store was so popular back in the 30s, everybody went to the dime store. And even though we had four in Tuscaloosa, uh, we all profited. Uh, and it was, um, you could buy most anything there, socks, uh, hardware, uh, yard goods. Uh, I was on notions. I, I worked on nearly every one uh, 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 of the, uh, we had a candy counter and a popcorn and did it smell good. And uh, you could just buy about anything at the dime store and you would see about anybody there because uh, everybody came and went in the dime store. It is not a department store. Uh, it, it is very different from a department store. Ours was on, uh, well, first it was on Greensboro in a very old building, not air conditioned. And uh, then we moved into a new building up on Main Street, University Boulevard. And it is still there. It was a spacious, well-lighted place. And it was across the, uh, from what was then the city, National Bank, a charming little building, a uh, 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 bank. And then across the avenue was uh, Crest, it's, if you will, Look up, you will see our name in gold up there still, Chris. And ever since then, when I've been in Washington, D.C., I've made sure to go by National Gallery and look at the art collection. I helped contribute to the American people by my work at Mr. Chris's store. Well, thank you for that. Um, and also, you answered the, my follow-up question. You really painted a picture for how Greensboro Avenue looked back then. So you said it's across the street from what's, um, what was that bank building. So I think I know what you're talking about. It's, it's on the corner of Greensboro and University, correct? No, that was always Brown's. Brown's. Oh, okay, okay. And then you go another block toward the university though, and there was a charming little bank, city, National Bank, mm -hmm. across the boulevard, from there was Crest and is the Crest building. Just look up and you'll see big gold letters, Crest. I'm definitely gonna have to look for that because I'm interested to, because I'm pretty sure I've seen the building all the time. I've just never noticed that Crest, that Crest lettering on the building. So I'll look for that. Also, um, I want to talk about your experience um, working at the store. Anybody who has ever worked in a retail store they um, typically have a funny or interesting story. Can you recall a funny or interesting story from your time working in the Chris um, Dime store? Uh, I uh, eventually became Head Notions Girl and I sold eyeglasses. And it was so interesting to me that uh, people uh, would say to me, uh, your eyeglasses are all wrong. You ought to have some like mine. Try mine on. And I had been to uh, Dr. Cersei, uh, uh, who was a, a real uh, doctor of the eyes, ophthalmologist. And uh, uh, anyway, that was one woman said to me, I had 
the best eyeglasses and I lost them. I could even see a chigger with them. And now, you know, uh, with us country people, seeing a chigger was important because they really itched. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, a Brookwood neighbor came to have me fit him with glasses, Oscar Smith. And uh, he was very pleased with what I fixed him up. Uh, oh, he could see to read and uh, he went off happy but there remained an odor. And I just could not understand every time I went near the eyeglasses, there was this offensive odor. Finally, I found he left his pipe behind and I took it up, a hand, I did not touch it, but I handled it with uh, papers and I took it back to Lost and Found. The manager wouldn't have it. He says, that thing stinks too much. We can't put that in lost and found. You take it back to your counter. And I took it back to my counter and I kept that smelly thing until he sent his wonderful wife, Alice Prude Smith to uh, get it for him. And that caused much laughter, uh, my stinking counter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but lots of odd things did happen. We got, found a little lost dog uh, wandering around in our Crest store and uh, uh, just lots of, uh, uh, I found out a poor old kitty cat on the street and I brought him in and sent him to the basement for uh, Harry, our dear uh, porter to look after till I could get him home. So much happened. It was most interesting. So thank you for that <laughs> and, and, your, and your stinky counter story. <laughs> but um, throughout this book, I was impressed by the detail. You, um, you stated that you kept a journal and took notes um, back in your younger years. Um, can you talk a bit about the importance of recording your life experiences, whether it's taking notes or keeping a journal? I think it is important because we forget. And there are writers who don't have time to write when they're younger, but they will forget and they must write it down, some note that will bring it back to their mind. So when they do have a chance to write, they, can, uh, they will have a reminder because we forget. And I'll tell you, I, have a record in my diary of a wedding in maybe 1935, 38, somewhere in the 30s. Life was so desperately poor, but a young couple wanted to marry and they heard that the minister was having dinner at our house and they came and uh, uh, the minister uh, couldn't very well, he couldn't remember all the marriage ceremony, but he said, I think I remembered enough to marry you. And uh, uh, do you know when that couple celebrated their 50th anniversary, I took a copy of my diary account there and it was the best present they got. Mm -hmm. They loved it and had everybody sit down and had me read an account of their wedding. It was funny <laughs> and very gratifying. Then I uh, met a young woman in Tuscaloosa whose husband, young husband, was dying of cancer and it turned out that his mother had been one of my most memorable teachers. And though she was now dead, I had an account in my diary of things she told us about her tour of Europe. And I wrote, I searched all that out and sent it to him. And when I saw his wife after she, he died, she told me how much it meant to him. Yes, uh, there are many ways a diary can be important. 
I think that's important because as we go through life, these events may seem small at the time, but they will have significance later. So I think you're right. There is importance in um, recording these experiences because they're going to mean a lot to someone later. But um, my, my final question to you, Eileen, um, in the note to the reader in this book, you talk about the airplane that landed next to your house and how this experience um, one, led to you wanting to become a writer. Um, can you talk about the importance of seeing this airplane and how that led you to, um, to writing? Uh, it was a heavy, great day. I believe in 19 and 20, it may have been. And uh, my mother was fixing up greens and corn pone for our midday dinner. And we heard this terrible roar over our house which was already high, it was on a hill. And uh, we all ran out in the yard and there in our muddy field was an airplane. And there were two fellows, well-fed, nice looking, uh, who got out and hollered and said, where are we? And uh, we uh, uh, took them in, they had run out of gas they were from a place near Chicago. And it was, they talked different from us. They, we laughed uh, in private because they did not know about eating corn pone and, and turnip greens and baked potatoes and things like that. We didn't know that we were the ignorant ones. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, they were two brothers on their way to Vera Beach, Florida. And my daddy, they stayed with us for several days till my daddy could borrow money from somebody to buy gas for their plane. And then uh, uh, they left. At Christmas, they sent us a picture of the plane and them with the plane and three dollars for the gas that he had bought and a box of chocolate candy. Then six years later, the younger brother came back and that was an interesting visit. So they didn't forget us. That, that's great and it, it's, um, it, it must have been pretty interesting at your young age seeing uh, an, an airplane land next to your house and, and people from Chicago, a, a faraway land at that time, you know, visiting. And, and, and it's great that they didn't forget the, um, the charity that your, that your family showed them. Well, well Eileen, that's, um, that's all that we have for today. Um, I would like to thank you for joining us to talk about your, your latest memoir. And uh, if someone is interested in this, where can they find a copy? Uh, you can order it from Amazon. Are you uh, better yet? go to our local bookstore, uh, independent bookstore uh, there uh, and uh, get an autograph copy. Ernest. Ernest and Hadley. So yes, you can get an autograph copy from Ernest and Hadley, the local bookstore in Tuscaloosa. Um, so Eileen, thank you for joining us and, um, and, and take care. You too. Thank you.